All right. If you were with us last week, we started a study on the harmony of the Gospels or the Gospel accounts. And I even said last week, it's not Gospels, it's one Gospel. And then I just said Gospels. <laughs> uh, the one account of the Gospel. And uh, so what I did last week was did a little bit of an introduction. And in that introduction, we talked about how that uh, Matthew was written to the Jewish people. And of course, being written to the Jewish people, there's going to be a lot in there about genealogies. There's going to be a lot in there about fulfilled prophecies about the life of Christ, uh, how that He is the, the Messiah of the Old Testament, and that uh, He has now come. And so Matthew writes to the Jews. Mark, as we pointed out last week, writes uh, basically to the Roman people. The Roman people were a people that were very quick to do things. They didn't tally, dally around. Uh, they, they were quick and straightforward. And the key word that we talked about last week in the book of Mark is immediately. And if you remember, you might just turn to Mark chapter 1 for a moment. You remember we went through some of those statements that are found in Mark chapter 1. And you remember that I pointed out that even though it's translated differently in the King James Version, uh, it is the same Greek word. And the Bible says that uh, in uh, verse number 10, Mark 1 and verse 10, straightway coming up out of the water. You look down to verse number 12, it says, And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. You skip on down and you will see that he talks about in verse number 18, when he called the apostles straightway, they forsook their nets. Verse number 20, straightway he called them. I'm not going to go through the rest of those verses, but do you see Almost a sense of urgency in the way that Mark is writing. That would appeal to the Roman people. As a matter of fact, uh, there are some cultures today that still that, that kind of uh, description is going to appeal to them. They, they don't like to uh, uh, take their time. They want to move immediately. They want to move quickly. And so Mark wrote to the Romans and uh, he dealt with that aspect of Jesus Christ. We pointed out also last week that Luke wrote to the Greek-speaking people. And of course, the Greek-speaking people, for the most part, were very educated people. And uh, in the Greek mind, they wanted to know about the ideal man. What did the ideal man look like? And what we're talking about when we say the ideal, what is the pinnacle of manhood? And of course, as Luke, who is a physician, as we pointed out last week, as he would write to them, he's going to deal with that aspect of Jesus Christ. Uh, we pointed out last week that Luke will, he's not alone in this, but he does it quite frequently. He uh, uses the term that Jesus is the Son of Man. Not only is he the Son of God, but he is the Son of Man. And of course that's going to appeal to the Greek people because they wanted to know about what a man looked like. And then of course we pointed, that, pointed out that John, when he wrote his account of the Gospel, he is going to focus primarily, um, or not primarily, but generally to the entire world. It's a broader spectrum that John is writing to. And so what I said last week is that uh, I hope to set forth some principles. I, did, I, I said I don't really think we want to spend the time in going through each and every one of these. Uh, but then this week, actually I found it last week, I, I found this uh, study course called The Harmony of the Gospels. And uh, again, that's their language and not mine, but The Harmony of the Gospels. And it takes about 26 lessons to go through all of this. So uh, based on that, we're going to give it a whirl. And we're going to go through and, and try to do as they did. I made 10 copies of this. If you want a copy of this, you can grab one. 
and if we need more, I can print out more next week, but it will give you kind of a study guide of what we're going through. Uh, when you look at the, the date, uh, since I borrowed this from somebody on uh, the internet, it was done in 2015, so that's all their notes, but uh, what we want to focus in is the Bible text, the period of time in the life of Christ that it's talking about, and then the specific events that are going on. And so I tried to enlarge this enough that you can read it. I hope that you can see. So uh, last week, and I asked you to turn once again to the book of Luke, to Luke chapter 1. Last week we pointed out that what Luke is going to do in his introduction to Jesus is explain why he's writing what he wrote. And so in Luke 1 and verse number 1, Dr. Luke writes, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So uh, Dr. Luke acknowledges most likely Matthew, Mark, and even possibly John, uh, writing about uh, Jesus Christ as eyewitnesses. Uh, Luke apparently was not an eyewitness in the same sense. He's not one of the apostles, so uh, he was not the same kind of eyewitness. But Luke is saying, I am going to write these things down. And uh, we talked about it last week in verse 1. He says, in order... I'm going to do it in order. Notice verse 3. He says, It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. We pointed out last week, Theophilus means lover of God. And so here's a man who loves God. Uh, we would assume he is actually talking about a man named Theophilus. And so he's writing to him. But notice he said in verse 1, I'm going to set this in order. And then he repeats that in verse 3, I'm going to write to thee in order. So as we pointed out last week, if you want a chronological timeline on how these events transpired, then you want to read Luke's account of the gospel. Because as you're reading from Dr. Luke, he being that physician, uh, you know, uh, very seems analytical in his approach to things, he writes it in exact chronological order. Where sometimes Matthew, Mark, and John, they don't follow exactly the, chron the chron that word, chronological, I can't even say it now. Chronological, that was the word I'm looking for, order. And so Luke is telling us, I wrote it in the order that it took place. And so what I would recommend if you're going to do this, if you're going to go through and look at how to harmonize all of these passages, Luke seems to be the primary one that you want to start with because it's going to follow the chronological order. I didn't mess up that time. If I try to say it again, I would. He's going to follow the exact order in which those events transpired. And so you've got what many in the uh, religious world talked about, Dr. Luke's prologue, and that's what we read just a moment ago, why he wrote what he did. John is going to give us a little bit, or not a little bit, a lot of bit, information about Jesus as he pre-existed as the Word. So let's turn to John chapter 1, John chapter 1. This is something we looked at last week, but uh, we didn't go through it very, and so I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, review from last week. So he says in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I just remind us that Jesus, as we know Him, pre in His pre Carnation, if, if, if we can even say it like that. I don't know uh, pre-incarnation. I, I don't know the exact words to describe this. But Jesus in eternity has existed as simply the Word. 
Um, in the Greek, it is ha, which is, uh, it looks like the letter O, but they put that, that rough H in front of it, so you would say ha logos, ha logos, he is the word. And of course, that, uh, that name that Jesus had before he took on flesh uh, is the name that you would see if you think about him as he makes several appearances in the Old Testament as the form of the angel of God. Uh, I've talked about that on many occasions that uh, when you see that phrase, the angel of God, most of the time, as far as I can tell, that is talking about Jesus before he took on flesh. He was the angel of God. And of course, you know the word angel means messenger. So he is the messenger of God to be set above any messenger that God would ever use, whether it's a celestial messenger or an earthly messenger. Jesus, the angel of God. And we learn from John 1 in verse 1 that not only was Jesus in the beginning, that means He was, uh, and, and the word there, or the words in the beginning has the idea of always existing. He has always existed. But in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and notice the Word was God. We pointed out last week, He is God. Jesus is God. Uh, he is, or He was, He's no longer equal to the Father, but in eternity before He took on flesh, He was equal to the Father. And of course we alluded to Philippians chapter 2, that He, he didn't take that equality with the Father as something that He should cling to, but He willingly gave it up. That's why He is not only the Son of Man, He's the Son of God. And so He is God. He has all the attributes of being God. And so you've got Jesus existing uh, for eternity as God. It tells us in verse 3 that all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so we see the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. But we find the transition in verse number 14. He says, and the Word, we would say Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. So the Word took on flesh. He was not flesh before that, but He was made, the Bible says, into flesh. He was made flesh and He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then, of course... Again, this is review, and, and I'm trying to do it as quickly as possible. But we talked about the genealogies last week. And we pointed out that in Matthew's genealogy, and you might just flip over there again, in Matthew's genealogy, he begins the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In verse 2 he says, Abraham beget Isaac, Isaac beget Jacob, and I reminded you, I said I'm not going to read all the genealogies, but I reminded you that the word beget is used every single time that so-and-so begets so-and-so until you get to verse 16. And in verse 16, Jacob beget Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Not that Joseph begat him, but he was supposed to be a descendant of Joseph. To everybody that saw Joseph and Mary, they assumed that he was the son of Joseph. But we know differently. He is the son of Mary, but not the son of Joseph. He is the son of God. And you've got those genealogies. I pointed out last week that in Matthew 1, you have the genealogy of Joseph, who everybody assumed would be his father. And then in Luke chapter 3, you actually have the genealogy of Mary. And in the genealogy of Mary, they both trace their ancestry back to Abraham. They go back to Abraham. 
And that's going to be important to the Jewish people. They want to know that this Messiah fits all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And of course the prophecies of the Old Testament, uh, Genesis 12, God spoke to Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, I'm going to give you descendants, and in thy descendants all nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And we pointed out that was talking about Jesus Christ. And so we'll move forward. This will be your second uh, cell in that below uh, Luke 1, Luke chapter 1. And what we're going to talk about for just a few moments as we look at Luke chapter 1, and again this corresponds to Matthew chapter 1, the birth and infancy of Jesus Christ but if you remember in Luke chapter 1, first there's going to be an announcement about John the Immerser. John the Immerser. Then John the Immerser is going to be born, and then there's going to be the announcement about the birth of Jesus Christ. Mary is going to visit with her uh, cousin Elizabeth about all the things that are transpiring. So in Luke chapter 1, we read, beginning in verse 5, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. What kind of people are we talking about in verse 6? Righteous, godly people who walked according to the law of Moses. Uh, the Bible says blamelessly. You, you couldn't charge them with violating the law of Moses. That's, that's a pretty uh, uh, great description of this couple, is it not? He says in verse 7, They had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in order of his course, and you remember that what they're talking about, that the, the priesthood had grown to such an extent, remember there's one high priest, but there are actually priests that would offer the sacrifices and do those things in the temple, and this had grown so large that they actually set up a system where if you were a descendant of this individual, and I'm just going to throw this out, I don't know the exact time, but you would come and you would work in the temple for two months. And then your time would be over and you would go back home. Another group of men would come in and they would do their work. Two months later they would leave and another group would come in. That's what he's talking about when he says, in order of his course. So verse 9 According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Notice that it says that it was his lot to burn incense. There were many things that the priest did in the tabernacle in the temple, and so it had grown so large that they had said, okay, you're going to be the one burning incense, you're going to be the one that's going to be doing the sacrifice, you're going to be taking care of the table of showbread, and so at this point, you've got Zacharias, who it had fallen to his lot, this time was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. Verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Well, that was one of the things that Zacharias was praying about. To have a son. He's an old man, but he still wants to have a son, right? And he's been praying. And he says, this angel reports to him, Look, God has heard your prayer. You're going to have a son. And when you have that son, you're going to call him by the name of John. So, verse 14, And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. 
but he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So you've got John, the prophecy that he is going to be great, he's going to bring joy, people are going to rejoice, God is going to hold him as great, and notice he shall not drink wine nor strong drink. That would of course allude to the Nazarite vow of Numbers chapter 6. Uh, when you were a Nazarite or when you took that Nazarite vow, uh, one of the things, you didn't cut your hair, you didn't drink anything, wine, strong drink, you didn't eat anything that had the capability to ferment, no corn, no grapes. It was a very, and that's why John ate locusts and wild honey because he was, he was under that Nazarite vow. We would assume from that that John probably had long hair because that was a part of the Nazarite vow. And notice that he was going to be filled with the Holy Ghost from the very moment of his birth. Even prior to that we will see as we go through this. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Elias. I just remind you, Elijah, remember in Malachi chapter 4, as, he, as God closed out the Old Testament scriptures, he told the Jews that before the Messiah came, there would be a forerunner, who would come in the spirit, the power of Elijah. And so Zechariah is hearing this, and there's no doubt him being a priest of God that those things are popping into his mind. He's thinking, wait a minute, if he's coming in the spirit of Elijah, he's the forerunner to Jesus. He's going to be the one to point the way to Jesus Christ. And so he's going to go, verse 17, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what was John's mission? Prepare the way for Jesus. Get people ready for the coming of the Messiah. That was his job. By the way, he did an excellent job in doing that. People would come from all parts of the nation of Israel to hear the preaching of John. And they came, as we pointed out, um, oh, uh, I think a couple, maybe three weeks ago in our study on the Holy Spirit, we pointed out that when Malachi ended, there were 400 years where God did not send a prophet to the nation of Israel. Then John, and I, and I say this uh, without exaggeration, erupted on the scene. And people heard about John and they just came from all parts of Israel because it's a prophet of God. Well, when they got there, did they get what they expected? <laughs> some of them did, some of them didn't, did they? Uh, the common man heard him like they did Jesus, but what did the religious leaders do? They rejected the baptism of John. They, they didn't want any, any part of John. And it's no wonder when they walked up, he said, you bunch of snakes, you generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. I don't know about you, but if I walked in the door and the preacher said, hey, you son of a snake, what are you doing here? I, I'd be like, whoa, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> what are you saying? Well, that's what John did to the religious leaders of the day. He said, you're, you're, you're a bunch of descendants of snakes. What are you doing here? You need to bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Repent and be baptized. Still the same way. That's right. So Zechariah in verse 18 said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel and uh, that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. By the way, that would be gospel in uh, the Greek. Huangalion would be the Greek. It's the good news. That's the same news that Jesus is going to bring. But he says, I'm bringing you good news. Verse 20, And behold, thou shalt be dumb, 
and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my word, which shall be fulfilled in their season. So he rebukes Zacharias for questioning. Uh, and you know, uh, that's, uh, how can you say this kindly? It's pretty bold or pretty ignorant to argue with an angel. <laughs> that's what he's doing. He's seeing this celestial being. He knows he's a celestial being because of his appearance. He's afraid, but then he wants to argue. By the way, there are a lot of people who want to argue today, too, with the gospel, don't they? They don't want to hear the gospel, so things haven't changed. Man's nature is the same. Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. Then she denied laughing, and yeah. So, so uh, it's not unusual that this happened, but you still wonder about Zacharias and Elizabeth being walking blameless before God, and Zacharias is arguing about it. I'm going to have a son. I'm too old. My wife's too old. What are you talking about? So it says in verse 21, the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. Apparently his job didn't take just a long time to do. He went in, burned incense, and he came out. But he's not coming out, he's not coming out, he's not coming out. So in verse 22, when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach from among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And uh, just as a quick reminder, a Nazarite vow and a person who is from Nazareth are not the same thing. So just so you know, there's a difference. The Nazarite vow is not that you came from the city of Nazareth. You were called a Nazarene if you came from the city of Nazareth. So a Nazarite and a Nazarene are not the same thing. Uh, just as a, a, a point to understand. So verse 27, This angel Gabriel went to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, How, or excuse me, Hell, thou, <laughs> thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of situation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? Verse 35, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of of God. So uh, at this point, Jesus is still the Word, but when He is born, He's going to be called the Son of God. Notice that distinction. Not only that, years ago, Brother Johnny Ramsey, and I know some of y'all uh, knew Brother Ramsey, he was one of my teachers in school, but uh, Brother Ramsey deba debated a guy named, I think, Marvin Hicks a oneness Pentecostal, and they believe that there is only one in the Godhead. Sometimes He will manifest Himself, they say, as God the Father. Sometimes He'll manifest Himself as God the Son. And sometimes He will use the designation, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God. They believe there's only one in the Godhead. So in this debate with Marvin Hicks, they had an opportunity for question and answers. And one of the questions that Brother Johnny 
kept getting was whose son is Jesus? Is he son of the Holy Ghost or is he son of God the Father? And Brother Ramsey, uh, the eloquent man that he was, he, knew, he quoted massive, I don't know if you knew this, he, he had just massive quantities of the Bible memorized and he would answer every time that the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which is born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And Brother Ramsey would say, That's all I know on the subject. And they would just spit and sputter, Well, you've got to tell us, whose son is he? He said, All I can tell you is what the Bible said. That's all I can tell you. So I'm not going to speculate and answer your question. I'm going to give you the Bible. And that's what the Bible tells us. So he's the Son of God, but the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her. Now, again, I'm going to go with Brother Johnny Ramsey on that. That's what the Bible says. And I believe it and I accept it. And that's what we ought to do. Verse 36, And behold thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. You ought to underline that in your Bible. Nothing impossible for God. I can say, biblically, there's nothing impossible with God. Now when you hear a lot of preachers talk about it, they'll say there's nothing impossible with God except something that goes against His divine nature. He can't sin, He can't do the... Brethren, you don't have to explain away what the Bible says. There's nothing impossible with God. Why can't we just be content with saying what the Bible says? Why, why do we have to, well, I, I, but he can't sin, he can't build a rock that, is, uh, that he can't lift, and all these trying to answer all the little minute arguments that people have thrown. There's nothing impossible with God. I can say that, and I can be content with that. Nothing shall be impossible. Verse 38, Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to the word. And the angel departed from her, and Mary arose in those days, and went into the hill country with haste into the city of Judah. She entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass, verse 41, notice this, when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and the Holy Ghost... And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to pause there, point out something that, that y'all know. We've talked about it many, many times. There's a Greek word for baby in the Greek language, obviously. Brephos, if I'm saying it correctly. That word is used right here. The brephos, the babe, leaped in her womb. Paul would use that same word in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14 when he talks about Timothy that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. You may be thinking, preacher, what does that mean? That means that a baby in the womb is a child and it is a sin to abort that baby. That's what we're saying. And that's what Brephos, the babe, the child, it's not a, a, a lump, it's not a a mass of cells. It's not a tumor growing in the lady's womb. It is a child. And that's what we need to understand, brethren. Uh, it's not that hard to defeat these people when you look at it. We will protect the eggs, the eggs, did you hear me, of a bald eagle. And it is a federal violation if you destroy the eggs of an eagle. Well, why not? They're eggs. I want to scramble them. No, I would be going to jail. Why? Well, that's not an eagle. It's an egg. And they would argue in federal court, that egg is an eagle. But they wouldn't argue that for a child in the womb. Shame. Shame on people that would argue like that. You can't transport a lobster when she has her egg sac on her tail. You can't even catch her. Well, you can catch her, but you release her immediately. And if you transport her, it is a violation of federal law. Why? It's just an egg. It's just a lump. It's just a bunch of cells. No, sir. 
Those are little bitty lobsters. Those are little bitty eagles. Even though they're still in their developmental, uh, developmental that word, stage. They're developing. I'm sorry, my tongue is tongled tonight. They're developing right now. And so they're still an eagle. They're still a lobster. They're still those things, right? So shame on us if we don't understand that. The babe, verse 41, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she spake out with a loud voice and, say, blessed, and said, Blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. She's speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. She says, The one that you are carrying in your womb is the Lord. That's powerful, isn't it? By the way, what does that do again to the argument of abortion? Could Mary have aborted her or aborted, aborted him at that point? And God said, well, it's all right. I'll just choose another one. What? No. No. So we see that. Verse 44, And lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for what? Joy. Can that babe feel joy in the womb? That's what it says. Not only that, I was coming back from visiting mom in the hospital in Tyler, and as I was leaving Tyler on 31, on Business 31, going down uh, to what there was a big billboard, and it had a picture of a little baby in a mother's womb, and it said, I can feel pain at 12 weeks. What is that saying? If a child at 12 weeks can feel pain, they can feel joy. And that's what we see in this. So, I'm going to, we're going to continue on for just a moment. So, uh, this babe, verse 44, leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Uh, she's saying that those that were saying the Messiah's never coming, the Messiah's never coming, she said God with just one flex of his muscle. <laughs> destroyed their argument. The Messiah is coming. The imagination of their heart has been scattered. Verse 52, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. What in the world does she mean in verse 52? The mighty have been thrown down from their seats and the exalted, uh, He's exalted them of low degree. What is He saying in that? If you're looking for the king to be born, we've talked about this on numerous occasions. Are you going to go to a manger in an inn? Or are you going to go to a king's palace? You're going to go to the king's palace. And here's Mary saying, Look, those that are in the king's palace are going to be brought down. And those of low degree are going to be raised up. That's, that's powerful, powerful language. And guess what? We're going to drive down a pig because <laughs> we have quickly run out of time. But I think you see what I'm doing with this. We're trying to follow, and I think we can do this in, in uh, a relatively short time, I'll say that. I figured it up. Uh, we can get through with this in about six months. And I thought, well, that's not bad for me. That'll be a year. <laughs> Uh, so we will continue looking at the announcement of John's birth, the birth of John, the announcement of Jesus' birth, and Mary visiting with Elizabeth. We'll finish up with that 
Lord willing, next Wednesday night, we'll move into the birth of Christ where he's presented at the temple. We're going to see the wise men visit Jesus and we're going to see them go to Egypt and then come back to Nazareth. So that's, that's kind of the plan. And if you want one of these so that you can be studying ahead, then grab them. And if we need more, we can print out more, but we can, we can uh, uh, use that. You can kind of be studying ahead on that. So I'm going to stop here and ask any thoughts, questions, comments. Any, did I go too fast? I probably did. Any, any questions? Yes, sir, Don? I, I haven't heard that. Yeah. Yeah. A virgin, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know. And I, I could. I, yeah. Yeah, 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 and I and and I, I yeah, and I, I don't know, but but the description that I see of her is not what I normally think of a thirteen-year-old girl. <laughs> this is a lady that uh, a girl that has some level of maturity. She's studied, she's known, so I, I don't know, I, I don't know, and yeah, and I know Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong unto God, if it were important, he would have said she's 13 years old in two months, if it was important, if he wanted us to know that. We do know she was mature enough that she had made good decisions, and uh, she was living a life that was exemplary to people that were around her. Uh, and she was a virgin, and we'll talk about that more next week. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. In what verse were you talking about? What? 15? Okay. Luke chapter 1 and verse 15? Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. When when John was filled with the Holy Ghost, is that verse fifteen, he will be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right, if not, uh, we want to say that, uh, you know, a lot of times we, uh, we feel like there's no way that we can live up to what God wants us to do. Uh, we, we sometimes will say, you know, uh, well, I'm, I'm just a sinner. I, I want you to think about what we read a moment ago about Elizabeth and Zacharias. They were walking before God blamelessly. That was back in verse number 6. We can, brethren, live the kind of life that God wants us to live. Uh, we do that, of course, by studying His Word, applying that Word. James said, don't be just a hearer of the Word, be a doer of the work. 
And uh, we as God's people need to stand up and say, hey, I'm living right, I'm doing right. Uh, and, and I think sometimes we, we, we soften the fact that a child of God can live like a child of God. And we need to live that way. And so this evening I hope that uh, you can say as they have that, you know, I'm walking in front of God. I'm not going to say that we're walking blamelessly. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit give that designation and not me. But I want us to understand we can walk in the light as He is in the light. And if you haven't been doing that, Brother Don's going to be leading us in an invitation song and we plead with you to respond to the gospel as one of God's children. Or excuse me, as someone who is not one of God's children. Uh, the Bible is crystal clear on what you need to do. And we'll just sum it up as we often do with the words of Jesus. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Mark 16 and verse 16. So if you've never been baptized into the Christ, we'll be more than happy to study with you. If you need prayers, then come as together we stand and as we sing.